then Merry Christmas, or Christmas Eve for a lot of you, isn't it? Because we're ahead of the times here in Australia. It's Christmas, it's Monday. I thought, what better time to start Mystery Mondays back up than today. So today's case, I think, is probably the most bizarre case that I have ever looked into. Like, when I was researching it, I couldn't believe that I was researching like a real case, like these were true events that actually happened. I kept thinking like this has to be fictional, this has to be like a myth or a story that someone created, but it's real and it is so bizarre. So before we get into things, if you are enjoying Mystery Mondays, make sure to give this a thumbs up so I know that you like them and that you want me to keep doing them. And comment down below any cases that you do want me to cover next week. And yeah, let's go into it. Let's yeah, let's go ahead and get into it. In today's case, we are going to be talking about the Silent Twins. So Gloria and Aubrey Gibbons, that was the parents of the Silent Twins. They lived a pretty normal life until 1963. They lived in the Caribbean where Gloria was a housewife and Aubrey was a technician for the Air Force. The Gibbons family already had two children by this point, but in 1963, on April the 11th at 8.10 a.m., Gloria at an RAF hospital gave birth to June and then 10 minutes later gave birth to Jennifer and these two girls would later become known as the Silent Twins. So the family moved to Linton which was in Yorkshire in England and then in 1967 they introduced a new daughter named Rosie. So like most twins, June and Jennifer were super, super close. They were inseparable. They had like a special bond um, and they were also very, very late to speaking. They could only say like three or four words by the time they started school. They were making like high pitched um, noises, like squeaking almost and talking super fast. So they were pretty much unintelligible. You could, you had to listen really, really hard to try and understand what they were saying. So anyway, they, they moved again to a place called Devon and this is where the two girls started school. So at this time, race was a huge issue. It still is now, but like even more so then, they were, the, the, their entire school was white. And so they got bullied and taunted really, really heavily for the color of their skin on top of the fact that they couldn't really talk. Um, and this had a huge impact on them. So after they went to school and started getting bullied really heavily, they just kind of cut themselves off from the world. Um, almost like they wouldn't talk to anyone. They wouldn't even make eye contact to anyone. Their little um, squeaky sounds and talking really fast. Um, it was kind of like their own little language and they would pretty much only use that to communicate and it became just impossible to understand what they were saying. And their little language, by the way, was also later determined that it was Barbados slang because that's where they were from, they are Barbadian, um, and English but like really, really sped up and like mixed together. They also had West Indian accents, I believe, which kind of played into the fact, like kind of played into their language. So anyway, from the bullying, they started refusing to read and write at school and the teachers just didn't understand it. They, they told the parents, they're like, it's fine. They're gonna grow out of it, um, but they didn't. When the girls turned 11, their family moved again to another base. This time it was in Haverford West, I think that's how you pronounce it, and this was in Wales. And at this point, they were not speaking to anyone, not even their family. So when they moved, the girls and their older brother Craig started school at Haverford West County Secondary School. and. This was even worse than the last school. Haverford West at the time, I believe, was kind of known um, for their racism. So they were bullied so heavily that the teachers actually would dismiss them five minutes earlier than everyone to give them like a head start walking home because the bullying was so bad. It was physical, um, it was like, you know, verbal, it was horrible. On their walk home and pretty much any time they were in public really, they moved in a sort of synchrony. They would do everything at the same time, like they were the same person almost. They would kind of mirror each other and I read, and this is so crazy to me, but they, like if, if they were riding a horse, like both of them were riding separate horses and one of them fell off, then the other one would fall off, which is, were they trying to do that? I don't know, they just, they were just kind of like in sync. And this is like, this is why I found it so hard. Like, 
to distinguish that this was a real story when I was researching because I was like, this just can't be like a real thing. It gets, it gets even crazier though. So this guy named John Reed, he was a school medical officer and he came in to vaccinate all the kids. And then there was also this other woman, her name was Marjorie Wallace. Um, and she, she was just a journalist and she was really intrigued by the girls. So she kind of um, befriended them a little bit, I guess. So this guy, John Reed, told the journalist Marjorie Wallace that when he was there, because um, I got, by the way, a lot of information from this article or this interview from a woman named Marjorie Wallace. She actually wrote a book on this whole um, case. So this guy named John Reed, she interviewed him and he told her that when he went to give all of the students their vaccinations, June and Jennifer were super bizarre. They, they were kind of, he, he described them as um, though they were in a trance. When he gave them their shots, he said that they were, he described them as lifeless, that they were just standing there almost lifelessly and they didn't react to the shots or to this guy at all. So this guy, John, he was super intrigued by this. I, I guess that's like, I can't think of a better word, intrigued. Um, and he told someone, which resulted in the girls being sent to Withy Bush, I think it's called. It's a hospital, and they were sent there in February of 1977. So of course, at the hospital, they did not speak to anyone as like I, I would have expected, and I'm sure you guys expected as well, they didn't speak to anyone. And it was to the point where they wouldn't even talk to each other in front of other people. And then eventually at 14 years old, the girls were sent to Eastgate Special Education Center, which of course, again, they didn't speak at. And this was like, this was like, I, I think like boarding school kind of thing. So the reason they were sent to this boarding school was to kind of learn a bit more about them and figure out how to help them. Um, to live codependent lives from each other because at this point they were so heavily attached um, that they just wouldn't speak to anyone, they wouldn't speak to each other in front of anyone, um, they wouldn't make eye contact, they wouldn't talk to their family. So they ended up deciding the best thing that they could do or the, the most logical thing they could do was to separate them. So they kept Jennifer at this Eastgate place and they sent June about 30 miles away to St. David's Adolescence Unit to help them like, I guess, learn to live independently from each other because maybe if they're separately, I mean, maybe if they're separated, they will learn how to live by themselves and maybe speak to one, um, like speak to other people. Um, and just kind of open up a little bit, but it had the complete opposite effect and the girls ended up becoming catonic. And basically, catalonia is the abnormality of movement and behavior, which is caused by a disturbed mental state. Basically, they just became totally withdrawn from everything to the point where they would hardly even, they wouldn't eat and they would hardly even like move at all. So they were reunited because they were just like, this isn't working. It's just making everything worse. And then eventually at the age of 16, they were sent back home because they had finished school. Then when they got back home, they ended up spending several years pretty much just locked away in their bedroom. They were playing with dolls, creating soap operas for each other. Like they would write them down and then reenact them for each other. They would make recordings and they really really liked to write so in this time when they were kind of locked in their room they would not even come down for meals um, and if they wanted to watch like a TV show or something they, they didn't even want to be in the same room as anyone other than each other basically not even their family so when they wanted to watch a certain TV show they would like leave a little note for their parents saying we want to watch this show at this time leave the door open um, so they would leave the family would leave like a hallway door open which you could see like the TV through it I guess if you sat down that hallway um, and they would sit in the hallway, watch their show, and it, it was to the point where like if someone got home or someone walked past them while they were sitting in the hallway, they would just run back up to their room. Like they wouldn't even like let someone walk past them. So basically they would sit on the stairs, which by hallway I meant like they, they, there's like a set of stairs and then a hallway and then like the TV room or something like that. Um, and they would sit on the stairs and watch the TV and, and that was pretty much the only time they would come out of their rooms. So as I said before, the girls were hugely into writing. They loved to write and they loved writing novels. They wrote diaries, like their diaries that they wrote about their lives, they took so seriously to the point where they would like 
revise what they wrote in their diary about that day and then like fix it up like they would do rough drafts of their diary and then for Christmas in 1979 Gloria bought them a red leather notebook um, and gave it to them which they kept like just really super detailed diaries or accounts of their lives in this another thing that I should probably mention is that the girls were on the doll so they used the money from their doll they like saved it up so that they could enroll in an online um, like writing class because they wanted to be famous novelists and they enrolled as a one person so they saved up all their money so that they can enroll as one person for this class mostly the novels they wrote about were like um, to do with crime and um, criminal behaviors and also sexual behaviors they did try and have a few of their novels published um, but no one would publish them so they ended up self-publishing their novels and when they self-published them they didn't really get like a lot of uh, notice a lot of feedback and this was really upsetting for them because they were sure that heaps of people would love these books so after they published these books and didn't get any attention for them they were so disappointed and at 18 years old they finally left their rooms but it was not for a good reason they were just acting out they were doing drugs and having sex and well, I mean having sex isn't that bad but you know what I mean like they were doing drugs having sex um, they were committing crimes so they just began a each other in public like they would get into these massive brawls and just really hurt each other um, they were breaking windows they would often just like break and smash windows they were stealing and they were committing arson so they ended up getting arrested because they went to this place called Pembroke Technical College where um, they got caught because they broke a window and there was a, a officer patrolling this place and he heard the window smash so he went to go check it out and then by the time he got there he saw the two girls and they were like starting to light a fire at this place so he um, detained them. They were sent to a romance center which is called the Puckle Church Romance Center and they stayed there for seven months and in the seven months they just began to hate each other. They wrote like diaries still, they were always writing and they just hate each other. They wrote in their diary about how much they hated each other or how they wanted to kill the other person or how they were scared the other person was going to kill them. I mean this was when they were together. They were write about how much they hated each other or they were scared of each other um, but then when they were separated they wrote about how lonely they were that the they, they were so lonely that they wanted to die and they missed each other and they wanted to be with each other but then when they got back together they just hated each other eventually in May of 1982 the girls were charged on 16 counts of burglary theft and arson to which they pled guilty the girls were said to have psychopathic personality disorder so because of this and because of their criminal behavior they were sent to this place called Broadmoor Hospital which was like a maximum security mental institution for the criminally insane and they were basically sent there indefinitely for an indefinite period of time while they were there the doctors described the girls as dangerous and and disturbed they said that like one day one of the girls would starve themselves while the other one just like ate everything and then they would the kind of swap and they would be on other ends of the hospital and nurses would often find them like frozen in the exact same position which is so creepy to me during their time there June attacked a nurse and Jennifer tried to commit suicide and Jennifer was also often injected with this drug called Depixel and this is an antipsychotic drug which um, ended up like kind of blurring her vision so she couldn't read or write. The girls were also constantly fighting so whenever they were together they would be screaming and kicking each other and scratching at each other and they stayed there for 11 years until eventually they were moved to a place called the Caswell Clinic which was just like a lower security of the same type of place. So just before the girls moved to this clinic Marjorie Wallace um, uh, the journalist that I mentioned before she was still like interviewing them and would talk to them often and visit them and um, all of that kind of stuff and just before they moved Jennifer said to her I'm going to have to die and obviously Marjorie was like a bit freaked out by it and a bit concerned um, so she asked why and Jennifer just replied because we decided the girl said that the day that they left Broadmoor would be the day that Jennifer would have to die because their whole thing was that one of them had to give up their life in order for the other one to live a normal and free life. Only one of them could live normally at a time. So they had been living um, strangely this whole time 
and not talking to anyone and kind of being closed off from the world because they believed that they couldn't be free and be normal until there was only one of them. So one of them kind of had to sacrifice their life for the other. In March 1993, at 31 years old, June and Jennifer were transferred to the Caswell Clinic, but when they arrived, Jennifer was unresponsive. So they rushed her to the hospital, which is where she was pronounced dead. When she was pronounced dead, they said that the cause of death was like a sudden inflammation of the heart. They checked all of her um, stats and everything, and there was nothing injected into her that could have caused this. Um, it was a natural death. The fact that she died of natural causes is the creepiest part of this whole thing to me. Like I, that is what I just can't, I just can't wrap my head around it. Nothing was inflicted. There was no poison, no drugs, nothing. She died of natural causes, just like when they decided that she was gonna die. I just cannot wrap my head around. Her sister June said that in the car when Jennifer passed away, just before she did, she rested her head on her and said, at last we're out, and then she passed away. I can't comprehend it, like my brain just doesn't want to understand it because I can't, I can't, I just can't, that's the weirdest thing of this whole case to me. I just can't believe that she passed away naturally. So Jennifer of course was buried and on her headstone June had written a poem which read, We once were two, we two made one, we no more two, through life be one, rest in peace. And basically, I don't think I've mentioned this before, but the reason for the headstone is because they kind of, from what I gathered and from what I researched, they thought that they were like one person. So now that Jennifer's dead, she's kind of like a part of June, if that makes sense. They kind of thought they were one, and so they couldn't live a normal life until one of them was dead. And just like they said, after Jennifer's death, June just completely changed and pretty much became a normal person. She did have to like learn and um, slowly get into speaking again because they hadn't spoken for so long and they had like their own language. So she was released from Caswell like a year later and she takes or took medication every single day. And she did speak but sometimes like when she was a little excited or something um, she would be kind of hard to understand because I guess like if you've been talking like that for 31 years it's hard to just switch off and just start talking normally. Every Tuesday she would visit her sister's grave and she also started asking to be referred to by her middle name Allison rather than her first name June um, because she wanted to start like a whole new life basically as kind of like a new person. Marjorie Wallace actually wrote in her book and she said that it took June five years to accept her sister's death and to stop mourning and to stop feeling guilty about it. Um, and accept that her sister was a part of her. It was just it's crazy to me. Um, but yeah, that's pretty much the whole story. That's the whole case. It's not like an unsolved mystery or anything. I guess it kind of is because it's like, it's a mystery to me how she died from natural causes. And it's so confusing to me. This is just so confusing to me, this case. Um, but obviously I don't really have any theories or anything because this isn't one of those kind of cases. It's basically like me telling you a story, a real life story that really happened. Like this was a real thing. So yeah, I really hope that you guys enjoyed this one. If you did, please make sure to give it a thumbs up for me and hopefully I will see you in my next video. Bye.